I'm Arianna Kelland and we are live from The Gathering Place in downtown St. John's and today we're talking about addiction, opioid dependency and a hot topic over the last month and that's fentanyl. And we have three very special guests who have agreed to take your comments and questions live. So if you do have a second and you do have a question or a comment, uh, you can put that straight to Jeff Bourne, who is the founder of U-Turn and Carbonier, uh, Dr. Bruce Hollett and Health Minister John Hagee. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So Jeff, I want to start with you. I want you to just tell me what you guys do at U-Turn and what you're seeing out in the Carbonier area. Uh, U-Turn is basically, uh, we're a drop-in center for people that's looking for help for addiction of all nature. Uh, we do referrals to different uh, health divisions, either Eastern Health, or if somebody's from the West Coast, we can uh, do the follow-ups there. Uh, we're open during the day for people to drop in and get in a clean, safe environment, uh, because a lot of times you got to get a change people, place and things, and get a new group of friends. Uh, we kind of take a holistic approach with addictions, right, the mental, physical, and... I guess the whole part of it. Uh, we got recovery meetings there during the week. Uh, we got five recovery meetings, and uh, January past there was a a new uh, mental illness support group that started also. So there's all kinds of support coming from this little place we call U-Turn. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, there, uh, we help people that had cancer arrange their funeral arrangements. And uh, Tammy, I went in the delivery room with another lady in recovery, and so I guess everything from Point A to point B, we kind of take everything in between that. We kind of just come alongside of people and give them the love and support that a lot of times by the time they reach U-turn, uh, they got all their bridges burned, right? And we're the ones that you will come in and we'll say to them, we'll love you until you learn how to love yourself again. Now, you spoke with us back in September of 2016. And at that time, you said that what you see with opioid addiction, it's reached a level, it's an epidemic. What are you seeing now? What types of drugs are you seeing being used? Uh, well, it's been an epidemic in our way for a number of years, right? I, myself, I'm open. I'm in recovery myself. Uh, my drug of choice at the end of it was opiates. Uh, it kind of took me down that dark road. And that's about 12 years ago. And uh, <clears throat> I guess the last couple of years is more, I think we're U-turn open. Uh, there's more awareness within the Carbonate region now, so therefore the Stigma is starting to drop a bit, so people is reaching out for help. Uh, so I guess Oxycontin is still the drug of choice in our neighborhood, but a lot of people now they're turning over to uh, Dilaudid and stuff like that. So there's still a, a major issue in our in our little area of Cipsin Bay North, right? Have you been hearing many concerns about fentanyl in your area? Uh, a lot of people that come to me, uh, they're worried, they're afraid, they're scared. But then again, the other side of the foot, you got people come in, well, I'd like to try just to push it to the limit. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of addiction, right? I mean, to say, somebody in a normal frame of mind got a friend in the hospital in intensive care because of an overdose, but they want to push themselves to the limit. And it's kind of sad the power of addiction have on people, right? And a lot of times people come in and they're kind of worried of, if I take a hit today, is I going to die? So the only thing I can suggest is like, if you got a pill and you're buying something off the streets, quarter it up or one eight, at least you can have a chance if you take mm -hmm. a, a quarter of a pill and hit a hot spot of ventanol, at least you might have a chance to get uh, some medical attention, right? I want to bring in uh, Dr. Bruce Hollett. You're the Divisional uh, Chief of Family Medicine, Chronic Pain and Addiction at the Waterford Hospital. So obviously you're dealing with people who may have similar concerns. What is it that you're seeing? Seeing complex issues. Uh, seeing people from all walks of life uh, who have um, various ad addictions. It's uh, opioid substance use, mostly substance use disorder, meaning that there are multiple agents involved. The opioids, uh, which we tend to treat with suboxone or buprenorphine or methadone, uh, is uh, a large part of my practice. But it's more than that. It's the overall seeing the person for who they are and dealing uh, with the underlying issues that brought them to using opioids, whether they be mental health disorders or problems at home or just wanting to get numbed from emotional pain. And can you put a face on what addiction is? Is that a possibility? So it's a complex face. It's a, if you're going to look at a, a picture, it's a complex Picasso. 
It's something that uh, has multi-layers uh, and multi-colors about it. it. It's everybody. It can be one of the people here in this room, just at one wrong turn, and a person can have an addiction issue. It's the person who goes into their family doctor or to their dentist and receives a, um, instead of getting an antibiotic, they receive an Oxycontin, or they get an Oxycontin with their antibiotic and said, go home and they take your first pill and they're not able to get off them. So then they spend the rest of the time searching for it. Or it's a construction worker who is, uh, strains their back the day before and says, oh gosh, where can I get something to really have pain? And his buddy says, well, I got lots of Percocets here in my trunk. How about coming over? And he gives him some Percocets, 10 Percocets to try. He finds out, oh, well, that's really good. And then all of a sudden he's giving his paycheck to that individual. It's a very sad. And then it's the issue of the, what we're looking at now is the difference between illicit and illicit drugs, the pharmaceutical grade and the non-pharmaceutical grade. Uh, we all get concerned about the pharmaceutical grade, and that's been going on for, for years. The illicit part of it is what's coming in from China. It's called white China or China white. Uh, and it's the uh, fentanyl the carfentanil, the elephant tranquilizer, the, the drug that's 10,000 times stronger than morphine. Uh, just 10 milligrams can anesthetize a 15,000 pound elephant. So that's what we're starting to see coming into the streets. I've had a number of patients who have come and told me that they've supported their habit by going to Vancouver and picking up 4,000 tablets of, uh, of Percocet, that, or not Percocet, they're actually carfentanil. Wow. Uh, what makes this even more frightening is there's a whole line of these in the hopper. Uh, w47700 is uh, one of the ones that are quoted uh, recently on the west coast of the United States. Same type of thing. It's coming from Upjohn or, or Jensen's years ago. Stuff that didn't make it into the pain control because it just didn't work. But now people, uh, usually in Asian countries, are in clandestine labs, producing this, sending it over as a powder. It then goes into somebody's kitchen, that's their clandestine lab, and they'll produce it into a Percocet or an Oxycontin, goes onto the street, and it's just, just said, hot spots into it. You don't know how much of what is in the pill. I'm gonna bring in uh, Health Minister John Hagee in just a moment, but just a reminder that we are taking questions and comments live from our Facebook page. So if you do have a question for any of these gentlemen, make sure you just put it in the comments section and we'll get to that in a bit. But um, Minister Hagee, of course we heard, learned over the last month that there were a cluster of overdoses on the Northeast Avalon. How, what was your first reaction when you were briefed on this and told that this is what was happening? Well, unfortunately it was kind of a feeling of, oh, well, it's all right. I mean, last year we looked at what was happening over on the west coast of uh, Canada uh, and we uh, <clears throat> got a, a, a fright there. So we decided to act on that and we tried to put in place a rolling program based on the, the real strategies of, of uh, addiction management. Education, both of practitioners and the public, uh, harm reduction strategies. And the biggest piece of that in many respects was the naloxone. Uh, and we had those kits on the uh, frontline rigs. Uh, we then got a program to put kits in the community uh, and the event that we had in Bannerman Park was uh, the next step in that which not only brings those kits out to a more street level but is associated with a street level uh, campaign of awareness for people who may not use uh, traditional media. It's to get the attention of those people who are with those people who use for whom a, uh, a naloxone kit would be an asset because they come into people, into contact with people who may actually inadvertently overdose. And really to echo uh, Dr. Hollett's uh, comment, the, the street drugs that you're talking about, there is no such thing as a reliable or trustworthy drug dealer. You really don't have any quality controls at all. Uh, and one of the discussions we had at the federal level was around uh, unregulated pill presses because you can make uh, food dye and uh, chalk essentially into something that looks very like Percocet or Oxycontin uh, and you've no idea what's in it. Uh, we have a comment that would be directed towards you, um, but we can turn it into a question. Uh, Joan Noonan says, this will never be solved as the government does not have the money or the interest in dealing with these issues. We need results and not some rehab built in some community that is difficult for the mass of people to avail of because it is politically expedient to do so to create a few jobs. So 
I guess what Joan is saying is that we're not dealing with some of the root issues. So do you think that the government is doing a good job in, in dealing with addiction and the root of addiction here? Well, I think the first thing you've got to do is say, we can fix this, or at least we can mitigate it. Because if you say we can't, then you've given up before you even start. Um, we start with education. We start with education, as Dr. Hollett said, in schools. We start with a discussion in the community about what addiction and drugs are like. And the tent is a very visible way of doing that. You put that in festivals, uh, maybe salmon fest or mussel bed, something like that. And, you know, people will say, what's that about? This is about drugs. And you get this whole topic out of the shadows. You then go to further harm reduction and we cooperate with SWAP and folk like Jeff at U-Turn for um, harm reduction strategies, needle, needle exchanges and things like that. Naloxone is a harm reduction strategy. The challenge at the back end of the piece is to support physicians and clinicians like Dr. Hollett to provide those addiction services and make sure the transitions that Jeff talks about are seamless. So from the, the first thing you've got to do is admit you have a problem. The, the key in the naloxone kit is not just the drug, it's to call 911. That gets you into the system. The system then has to be built up, and we're in the process of doing it, and we're not there yet, built up to deal with the demand in terms of those people who have overdosed or have decided they have an addiction that needs help. Because until someone says they need help, you, you could, you, your hands are, are fairly tied. Although we did take some steps in the fall uh, in the winter to bring in secure detox legislation for youth so that they could be protected in circumstances where their capacity was, a, was, was not uh, appropriate. So we've done uh, some things, we have more to do. Now, um, speaking about those 21 overdoses, those people when they overdosed and they were in hospital, were they, did, were they sent home with help? Were they sent home with naloxone kits or you know, information on how they can get rehabilitation? Their first point of contact with the emergency services is uh, to, to turn up and turn up alive. So that's 21 people who were alive who might not have been had that naloxone not been available. The challenge we have is that we're hearing anecdotes of the kits that we've distributed being used and 911 not called. So it's very difficult to track those numbers because we've tried to put as few barriers in the way of people getting the kits as possible. So we don't make them fill out long forms and give ID and, 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 and phone numbers necessarily. We would love to know how they've been used and whether or not it was successful. And, and so we can replenish the kits. Uh, but uh, our challenge is sometimes what we don't know rather than what we do. And it's a very difficult group to, to pin down. Yeah, and I want to turn the conversation to Jeff and maybe you can shine some light on this. So you're recover in recovery yourself. Why do you think someone who is having an overdose not go to hospital and seek treatment after they've kind of brought themselves back to life with naloxone? Yeah, well, as uh, Minister Hagee was speaking, what came to mind is the uh, idea <clears throat> was May the 7th that the federal government came out with the uh, Overdose, uh, Good Samaritan Overdose yeah, Act. Good Samaritan Act. So yeah. if anybody's out there, just go on and then Google uh, the Good Samaritan Overdose Act Canada and just go on it that there is a thing put in place. Uh, just to answer your question on that part, a lot of times people, if you're on probation and you got somebody in your house that's overdosing, well, would I call 911 because I'm breaching my probation? With this new act, uh, you, you, you are not 100% on this, yeah. but you will not help be held liable of bre breaching your probation because or your parole because you called a 911. And the same goes if you are with someone who has overdosed, I believe. Um, and if you call 911 and you stay you with them. You can't be charged with possession yeah. if you're in the presence of drug para paraphernalia or small quantities of drugs uh, if you have called 911 on behalf of someone else. In actual fact, this province does have a good Samaritan uh, law of its own, but it was more generic in terms of protecting uh, a bystander from legal action should they assist somebody. Uh, in an emergency. This is very specific and puts it in the framework of drug use. The child youth services is another fear that people have. Yeah. So if they are afraid, someone comes in and says, well, there's children here, we just had an overdose, they'll call, they're afraid to lose their children. Yeah. Whether that's real or it's in their mind, it makes no difference. Yeah. It's, it's real to them. 
And on the policing front, heard from Sergeant Steve Knight, who's with the Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit, who said their number one priority at this point is to get people help and to into hospitals. But I want to switch gears and talk about this from a medical point of view. Uh, we have a question from Brian Kiley. He says, could there be a Newfoundland and Labrador problem or general problem of doctors over prescribing medications such as Percocet leading to addiction and these drugs being sold on the street? And that's a question for Dr. Holland. Um, it's a very good question. Uh, without a doubt, there's been an over prescription of um, opioids traditionally since dating back and I, I remember getting the first in 1997 my first uh, fax in which um, you can prescribe opioids because if you have pain you won't get addicted. Wow. That's a huge impact. Uh, Purdue were the, were the culprits at the time. They, they tried to right the wrong but, but they had uh, by causing more wrongs and then they tried to write that and they got even deeper in. So what ends up happening is uh, lots of times it's difficult to phys get physicians to do things. Once they do, it's difficult to get them to stop. But um, we have to be very concerned here about two things. We have a pharmaceutical grade and we have a non-pharmaceutical grade, as I've mentioned before. So we have to be very concerned about the non-pharmaceutical grade that people are taking. Uh, there's more recently, especially in Vancouver, there's been more of these non-pharmaceutical uh, causing deaths than the pharmaceutical grade. And here in, in the last three weeks in St. John's, a lot of the prescriptions for opioids uh, have started to dry up. So doctors are fought because of the pharma pharmacy uh, monitoring system. Right, so what, what is the spin-off of that then? So what ends up happening is uh, they find out it's being abused, they stop it immediately, and then the person is left with, where do I go? Uh, so what the, the rule of the thumb has always been, I keep a third for myself and I sell two thirds. And a lot of people who uh, do this for a living, or uh, augment their living, I should say. And we're talking about senior citizens, we're talking about adults that are uh, doing this. So when that happens, that puts a tremendous impact upon those individuals. So do you think that you're going to be seeing more people heading to the streets Without, because they're not getting those I, prescriptions? I believe. If we take what happened when the Center of Disease Control uh, two, three years ago suggested uh, that we should be prescribing between 50 and 90 um, milligrams per day, which is our same suggestions here in Newfoundland, there was a huge decline in opioid prescriptions. So they, they dropped uh, like a stone. Uh, but when they looked at the death rate, the death rate didn't do the same. It actually increased higher than it was going before. So what happened was uh, street naive individuals started going into the street, didn't know what, as Jeff was saying, you know, uh, when a person is a street smart, they know what to look at. They know when a, a Percocet's a bad, right? But someone who's been getting it from their doctor for years will go, well, I don't know what's what, but I got to have this because look at the state I'm in, right? Water streaming off me, I'm aching over, and if, uh, in my legs, my arms, and the pain of this is so intense that uh, I've had people tell me they would kill for, for a Percocet. If you're uh, just joining us now live, we are with uh, Health Minister John Hagee, Dr. Bruce Hollett, and Jeff Bourne, who is one of the founders of U-Turn. Uh, the next question uh, is for you, Dr. Hagee, Minister Hagee, both hats, uh, from Judith Bennett. And uh, she says, mental health is 90% of the problem. At an early age, addictions happen when one needs to numb. Whatever the choice, individual care, mental health care is needed most. So when you're looking at dealing with this addictions problem that we have, how much of the weight do you put on mental health services? The two are, there are, there are three populations in our experience from our statistics. There are a group of people with addictions, there are a group of people with mental health issues, and there's an overlap between the two. Some people would argue the exact number ranges between 25 and 45% who have that overlap. 
so the size of it is open to debate, but the, there, is, there is an interaction. That's where the real challenge comes. Uh, dealing with folk with mental health issues is difficult. Dealing with people with pure addictions, if such exist, is difficult. But that co-located group are a real challenge. Um, the two are inseparable. But from a systems point of view, what I would point out is that uh, mental health in general has been underfunded and has been regarded with some stigma over the years. And that's slowly changing. It doesn't happen overnight, but I'm pleased to say it's slowly changing. Um, but if you look at addictions within the construct of mental health, I would argue that addictions was a Cinderella of mental health. It was even more shunned and even more stigmatized than having a diagnosis of, say, bipolar or schizophrenia or something like that. Uh, because one would, would arguably fit with a medical model, the other was deemed to be not a disease, but some kind of moral failure or a lifestyle choice. And that is not the case. It is a disease uh, that, it, that is a disease spectrum. We need to look at mental health from a variety of points of view. And Dr. Hollett raised some very interesting points in our discussion um, that um, resilience and, and coping skills at school lay the foundation for mental resilience, which helps combat stress and anxiety and depression, but it also reduces the incidence of children and youth experimenting with drugs and then becoming addicted. It may not take more than one hit of Percocet or Oxy or, or, or whatever if you survive it and then you're hooked. Uh, it, it's, the, the question is to try and build in resilience. So you start with prevention and then you work through the system. You have to look at wait times and access points. You need open access. And I think one of our challenges as government is that we have a whole range of services out there, but folk don't know they exist. It's not well communicated or well understood in the community. Those people who may have seen it forget it when they're in crisis or have a problem and they don't know where to turn. But we do have 24-hour mental health crisis lines. We do have drop-in centres. Eastern Health has got its doorsteps programme. There are community groups like Jeff's where you can walk in. There's 811. There's the warm line. There are a whole variety of places you can go for people who are really truly sick. There's emergency departments. There are family practitioners. There are mental health workers. So there's a lot of things out there, but um, we need to make sure we, we, we deal with the gaps between the community piece, the hospital piece, uh, and in some cases, a corrections piece, because that's another piece of it. Too. Yeah, and, and talking about resources and these programs and the health line, but you need a good foundation for that. And right now we have a penitentiary that's at capacity. That was parts dating back to the Victorian era. You have a Waterford hospital that's just as old. I mean, what are you going to do to, to fix some of those problems? The, the fix for the Waterford and the penitentiary, in my view, lie in the community. We put in place a strong community-based program uh, for mental health and addictions, and the demands on a place like the Waterford will drop. One of the recommendations of the All-Party Committee, for example, refers to the penitentiary and suggests that maybe, uh, as, as a country leader, we should actually repatriate health care from corrections to health for correctional inmates. And certainly, we've already started discussions with justice and public safety about that kind of approach and how that might, again, get rid of a barrier between those who are in uh, uh, an institution, a correctional facility, and those who are in the community for healthcare, because it would be the same groups and the same people looking after them. So I think you have to shift your focus. If, if you wanted a, a quick fix approach, it, the good foundation is prevention and good primary care. That's where your best bang for your buck will rely in the long term for both mental health and addictions. You, you, you have to, this is all of our problem. Yeah. This is not an isolated Eastern health problem, Western health. It's all of our, we have to reduce stigma. We have to support our fellow person. It's a person, not an addict. It's not a junkie. It's a person with substance use disorder. So we have to do that. And then what, as we're doing it, we have to support our physicians. We have to give education building programs, which we're doing which the government is doing behind closed doors that nobody sees. So there's really good capacity being built uh, and there's a will to do it. So um, although that may not have existed in the past, it's certainly here now. 
And I'm glad you brought up stigma because this is something that you know all too well about. And we have a, a comment here from Ronnie Goss who says that the stigma associated with addiction needs to be changed before many people die. The government has to do more than issue naloxone kits. We need more addictions services. So we'll get to the second part in a bit. But uh, when we spoke before about this, um, every time we do a story, I know with CBC, um, on addiction or any of these fentanyl-related stories, um, we have a handful of comments that say, well, if you don't want to overdose, then don't stick a needle in your arm to begin with, or don't, don't snort a drug up your nose to begin with. Can you speak to that? Uh, well, the stigma part of it, like we're, we're located in, in rural Newfoundland, uh, the stigma is still heavily attached to addictions. Uh, one of the ways you turn operate, uh, there's times we meet people at their house for a while till they get comfortable and they come to U-turn. We meet them at a coffee shop and just get their communication going back and forth and, and get them to come in. And once they come into the doors and look around the room and say, oh, very good, well, I'm not so bad now because look at such and such. Uh, there is times that I, I heard that around the bay and, and it makes, makes me cringe that people are set down with a cold cloth on their child's head overnight. So they won't overdose for the sake of bringing them to a word because did you hear about such and such that or daughter? Wow. So it's kind of sad that 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 is way. But uh, like Minister Haggy just said, that there was a lot of work done the last number of years on this uh, stigma of mental health, and now we're at a place now that the stigma for addictions is finally starting to get on the radar. Uh, I guess for me, uh, I look I look at my life, and most of my experience come from my past experience on myself. Uh, for the stigma part of it, I look at it today that was I worried about who seen me falling off the bar stool? Was I worried about the person that seen me at the club or running around like a raging lunatic trying to get my drugs? No. So why should I be worried about someone seeing me going into a center to get help to make me feel well? So at the, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Like, you got to come in and make yourself feel well. And when, when people talk about choice, uh, I, I just start off with, with the Aboriginals down there. Like, if you're raised in an alcoholic home, you've seen all this violence in your home, there's drinking and drug use going on in your home, that's normal living. You don't know about the good life there's over here. There's no choice there. There's no choice there, right? And for me, uh, I go back to choice. Uh, uh, like I said, I always go to my own lived experience. When I was about seven, six or seven years old, I bought a, hard, a pack of hard candy, which was alcohol into them. When that broke, it burned my throat, upset my stomach, tasted awful. But what did Jeff do? I put another one in my mouth. Do you know why? Because from here to the top of my ears, it got right warm and fuzzy. And that's the feeling that I chased. And everything that I put in my body today, that's mind altering from caffeine to, I tell people I'm addicted to everything from marshmallows to dynamite. Everything in between, I can't do in moderation. So for me, it's, it's, when people talk about this choice thing, it just irks me, right? So it must be frustrating for you yes. when you read some of these comments. Like, there's times in my life that I swore on my wife's life, I swore on my children's life that I'm going up to Johnny's up the road to look at Glenn, to get sods. I swear to life, I'll be back in 45 minutes. I meant it. Got up there, a guy gave me one beer. Three days later, I woke up in a merge. And then I was up on the floor for three days on their watch. The chemicals that was in my system, the doctor said, there's enough alcohol, you should be dead. And then he named a list of other drugs that I can't even remember doing have it. So for me, when I left the house, I had all these promises made to my family that I'd be back. But once I put something in my system, I was gone into races. Can you explain to people out there who say, okay, we're hearing that there's fentanyl on the streets. How about you just not do drugs now for two weeks? Can you explain to people why that's not doable? Okay, uh, talk about all kinds of addictions. You got people that gotta run every day. Try not to run for two weeks. You got people about Tim Hortons lineups, <coughs> right? I wouldn't, there's people that are waiting an hour to get a coffee at Tim Hortons in the lineup. Sure, uh, the drug dealer probably wouldn't wait that long. 
So I tell people, I said, give up your coffee for two weeks. Give up, if you're, if you're an avid reader, give up reading for a couple of weeks, right? Give up working extra overtime if you're a workaholic for a couple of weeks. Come back, talk to me, and tell me how hard it is. And then if it's an opiate, multiply that by a thousand or even more, and that's what the person goes through. Like for me, if when I went through my detox, the only thing I could say was it felt like I was bait with a baseball bat, the worst stomach bug that I ever had, right? And only for the point of being hospitalized, I would have went out and got it. Because if you know that you go over behind a, a plaza somewhere, and for, well, back then it was probably eight or nine bucks, now it's going to probably cost me a hundred bucks to get this little pill, and I'm going to be well for the day. Right? We're at a point now, don't, I mean, we've got to stop talking about the addiction. Let's talk about the pain of the people that's going through addictions. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment here from Kelly Ward who says, I've called 911 many times. The mental health, uh, mental health care required was not given. It was three nights in the last three months that ended in more desperation and an addict and a hurting soul sent home from the hospital in worse shape than when they went in. Help doesn't come from rejection. I'm going to put this question to you. Do you what gaps do you see currently in the healthcare system when it comes to mental health? Do you feel that you could do more with more resources or do you think it's a shift in the way of, of dealing with things? Um. Everything is not perfect. An individual will have individual pro difficulties. What we have to do, and we have people who, within the medical system, who actually think this is not a medical issue. This is, this is their own fault. And uh, although they know, and they know what the, the studies say, and they know what the research is saying, uh, they still say, well, it's a choice issue. So education becomes extremely important to attempt to change their stigma. So again, it comes back to stigma issues, education issues, and the willingness to actually think about your fellow man and have empathy for them to be able to move forward. By doing that, uh, you're not going to send home somebody who is hurting. You're not going to treat them inappropriately. You're not going to call them names or uh, comment on them afterwards. You're going to try to do whatever is available. Are there system um, issues right now? Of course there are. But are we trying to work uh, to solve them? Of course we are. So what we have to do is we, each one of us, and, and I, I can't help but keep coming back to, this is much of responsibility of you, and you're doing your part. Me, I'm doing my part. Jeff is doing his part. Mr. Haggy is doing his part. The person who drives in from Conception Bay South has to do their part. The person who's standing on the bus stop has to do their part. And the person with the addiction problem has to do their part. This is a societal issue, societal problem. And we're going to have a lot more. See, the opioid is not the problem. The opioid today, I mean, if we went back, it was, we had crack cocaine and we had all the, the lovely stuff that came out of the 80s, then the 90s, we got flavor changes each year, each year it seemed, each deca decade anyway. So once you have the change of medication or substance type, it's just going to go to another type. So what we have to do is treat the underlying addiction and mental health issue. If we don't do that, we won't get a handle on any of it. From a systems point of view, the forgotten conversation here is about still numerically the biggest addiction that we have in this province, which is alcohol. alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know the 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 problem is 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 addiction, uh, as as Dr. Hollett says, the, the drug has changed over over time. Uh, the problem, the pressing problem at the moment, is because of the nature of drug dealing and the nature of the, the world, uh, we have a problem that currently is being fed by uh, Chinese factories. And I know the federal government and the RCMP, for example, have been trying to do their part, Minister Philpott, they've been over to China and said, you need to shut these down or you need to regulate them or you need to do A, B and C, that will help us. And that's an ongoing dialogue. 
The pill press issue out on the west coast of the country is, is really significant. And there's legislation going through uh, to try and deal with that. But, you know, it was interesting. Uh, last week we had the Indigenous Roundtable. So I went back to the Innu Healing Strategy, which was written by uh, the two bands back in 2014. And in their first two pages, they say that healing is a partnership between the individual, the family and the community. And if you take that as a philosophical approach, it sounds airy-fairy. But each of us, as Dr. Hollett says, each group within there has got to do their own. And by pushing the problem off to somebody else and saying, we don't have any problem here, we don't have a role to play, what they're doing is not helping. They're actually being obstructive. It is a societal issue. And until uh, we, we get past some of the, the stigma issues, which is still out there, and this reluctance to participate that's out there, we're not going to go any further. No one tells a diabetic, you can't stick a needle in your arm each day. No one tells them they've got to reuse their needles. You shouldn't do that for intravenous drug users. What you should do is say, how do we get you to a place where you no longer need these needles? I have another question uh, for you, Minister Hagee. Uh, do we have d detoxification or rehabilitation centers here? And what is the wait time for a patient to be seen in this province? We have in St. John's the recovery center. I know the regional health authorities in their uh, regional centers have detox uh, protocols. We have the Grace Center and we have the Hope Valley for youth. Uh, interestingly enough, talking about resources uh, we've looked at um, and are still looking at a model from Vancouver again which has gone before us where um, emergency departments are not the place to deal with addictions there may be places where you can start the physical treatment around detoxification but there are a group of individuals who can be moved into and St Paul's has it which has a 24-7 a yeah. detox area basically they say fine you need help Go upstairs, you don't need a bed, they have a load of lazy boys, five or seven. You get uh, seen immediately by a nurse practitioner, they give you the Suboxone tablet and they start you on the physical road to recovery. Um, that, I think, would be something well worth looking at. The nearest thing we've got now is the recovery centre. That's now moved to a detox and, and, and medical model in very recent times as a result of initiatives between the Department of Eastern Health and, uh, and, and, and Bruce's shop. So we're getting there. We're not there yet. We're trying to get ahead of the wave, uh, and that's sometimes difficult because the wave keeps changing speed. To, to we're, we, we're currently working on uh, a program, uh, which Minister Hagee has not seen yet, so uh, I, I don't want it to be any big surprises for him. <laughs> but um, it's, the question is, if somebody comes into an emergency room and they have chronic pain or addiction issues, the question is, do you want change? Are you ready for change? If they say yes, then there will be a stream that we will suggest to them that you go and you are brought in immediately, whether it's to recovery, we suggest the same model as what he's talking about, uh, and are put on Suboxone as first choice. If you say, no, I'm not ready for change, then you're not ignored. You're followed then by uh, your family doctor will follow you up, peer support. Uh, people will be see, looking at, at you to make sure that, that you are not going to be lost in the system. We are going to wrap this up in just a couple of moments, uh, but I just want to touch on Suboxone very quickly. Can you mm -hmm. first tell me what Suboxone is, so, and is it available now in so, the province? Uh, suboxone is a combination medication of uh, buprenorphine and naloxone. So uh, buprenorphine is a partial agonist, or uh, partially works as an opioid. Uh, what it does is, it, uh, if you think of a teacup, and a teacup is filled full of ice, so in order to get uh, a high, the ice has to go down and fit into the teacup perfectly. Suboxone is little ball bearings that are sticky that go into the teacup and prevents the ice from going in, lodging into the teacup and stimulating and releasing the product. Um, it is shown to be very effective. It's a much safer drug uh, in the UK after uh, over 40 million prescriptions, they found that it was uh, five to six times safer than methadone. Uh, it is available here in the province, and we are currently working with uh, two different agencies outside 
uh, to uh, bridge a gap until our provincial program that we're working on, educational uh, program uh, brought by the NM, uh, the Newfoundland Labrador Medical Association, as uh, funded. Uh, so we'll give the opportunity for everybody in the province who's practicing, nurse practitioners, I hope, uh, we support that, and physicians to uh, prescribe Suboxone in some way, shape, or form. We're going to uh, wind things down now, and I want to thank everyone for their questions and for you guys for coming out and doing this. Uh, what are your final thoughts before we uh, end this? I think discussions like this in non-traditional ways are another piece of the big discussion that we need to have to get this conversation out there. I think uh, the, the important thing is we've seen over the last few months is this partnership between community groups, traditional medical resources and the willingness of government to, to go into areas where traditionally it has, has, has kind of not done it and in ways it hasn't done it. Uh, and and I'm, uh, I'm encouraged by the response I've got. I've not had a negative response from any of the groups I've discussed this with and that's really great. Bring it on. Let's get involved. Let's, everybody, let's encourage your family doctor to treat chronic pain, to the supports are there for him to do it, to treat addictions. Let's not run away. Let's, uh, let's encourage them and support the family doctor. Let's support your neighbor. Let's think outside of the box. Look at uh, what you can do as an individual and as a person to help your fellow. And uh, Jeff, you have the final word. Yeah, one thing we say at Uter is, uh you are no longer alone, right? Anybody out there, if you're struggling with addiction, just remember you're no longer alone. You got three of us here that got a passion for people that struggle with addiction. Uh, you can look at our website, uh, uturnaddictions.org, and get in contact with uh, our agency, and we're sure to uh, do what we can to help you. And like uh, they said, it's only the last couple of years that uh, it's all party mental health addiction that uh, we finally came to a place in society where lived experience and the government members and the professional field, we're all coming together and we're working together and that's something that's going to work. Uh, when it comes to community, I always go back to this. Uh, about 50 years ago, all these problems went to the church within the communities. Somehow or another, it got changed and it's all laid over on the government's lap. Uh, maybe it's time for us to start, not say taking all back from the government, but it's time for us as a community to come together and help the person next to you that's struggling with either mental health or addictions. And uh, that's my final thought. I'm just glad to be here. Thanks for asking me for uh, participating. All right. Well, thank you guys again. And thank you out there for offering your comments and your questions. And you can still keep the conversation going. If you have anything to say, just leave it in the comment section below. And if you are just joining us and you missed the discussion, you can go to our YouTube channel and you can watch the show there. Thanks and have a good night.